Three people die every day in Tennessee due to opioid-related overdoses, and that's according to the governor's office here in Tennessee. And unfortunately, that's just a, a very tiny piece of the information about this huge epidemic that we're facing. And here at 91.9 FM and APSU-TV, we're working to address this issue and find out how to get to the bottom of it and see how we as a community can help to address this problem. And joining me today is Jimmy Edwards. He's the Montgomery County EMS Director, and I'm Micah Terrell. Thanks for joining us today. Now, first, uh, Jimmy, let's talk about what opioids are um, for people who may not know specifically what they are. Can you give us specifics on what they are and how they work? Sure, opioids are either naturally occurring or they're made in a lab, and we call those synthesized. Most people understand them as uh, being named morphine or, or fentanyl uh, or heroin. And what opioids do is they attach to protein receptor sites that, uh, more specifically, the central nervous system, your, your brain, your spinal cord, and your nerves and they change the way in which our brain receives information from the body. Basically, blunting that or creating a euphoric, a, a good feeling. Definitely. Now, fentanyl in uh, particular, though, is really potent. Can you kind of talk about that issue as well? Yeah, potent in reference to its, its weight or its, or its volume. It is 80 to 100 times more potent than morphine, which is a very common uh, pain medication or medication you're given for pain in uh, hospitals and such. And as far as the work that you do with Montgomery County EMS, you've, you've been there quite some time and, and seen really a big change in how this is an epidemic has affected what you do um, work as there in the emergency services area. Can you talk about how things have kind of transformed over the, that period of time, several decades, Ryan? So we'll roll the calendar back 36 years. The ambulances at that time had one or two single doses of 0 0.4 milligrams of Narcan on board. Typically, the Narcan or Naloxone would expire because we didn't use it. We didn't see opioid overdoses occur, and we certainly didn't see heroin overdoses like uh, we would be trained in school that we would see in the urban districts. What's happened now is that uh, we have to really watch our inventory uh, at logistics to make sure that we have enough to meet the demand. We go from having 0.4, 0 0.4 milligrams of Narcan on the ambulance to having several milligrams of uh, naloxone uh, carried per truck and then several cases of the Narcan in our inventory at logistics. So a lot of planning, it sounds like, goes into looking at what you need and how, how has your planning changed due to this epidemic? Well, you have to plan, budgetarily you have to plan because it's not just the cost, which has significantly increased, by the way, of available Narcan, but there are other uh, items uh, such as bag valve masks that we ventilate patients with. If they don't have a pulse, there's a a life band that we use with a special piece of equipment we have to do uh, CPR. There are several uh, items that we use once we arrive at the scene, depending on the acuity of the patient, that uh, has caused a significant uptick in, in use, and uh, secondly, in, in cost, and then I'd say thirdly, in our approach or our tactics in, in regard to operations that, that Chief Proctor will talk about. And as far, can you give us a rough idea of, of how much a dose would cost of Narcan? Because I know it sounds like you have a, again, you said it cost has gone up. Uh, sure, sure. So uh, the, my most r recent understanding of the increase in cost is uh, back in the day, it was a dollar or two dollars a dose. And we are currently helping our Montgomery County Volunteer Fire Service by supplying them with naloxone and, and the atomizers that's used to administer it nasally. And we, we will spend uh, greater than $70 per kit to prepare them uh, for their first responder encounter. 
Wow. And how many kits typically might you use in a day? I know days are not typical for you guys. I mean, you probably have very untypical days, but maybe in a, an average day. Can you give so us a rough idea? An average, we're, we're encountering three overdoses a day. And, and to kind of put that in the perspective, if I could quote mm -hmm. the 2018 uh, medication, naloxone administrations, uh, the emergency medical services, the ambulances, the paramedics administered 832 times in 2018. Our first response system that we geared up in the summer, last summer, so we only had about six months of activity, actually administered it 168 times prior to our arrival. So that's uh, Clarksville Police Department, Clarksville Fire and Rescue, Montgomery County Sheriff's Department, and Montgomery County Volunteer Fire Service are all first response agencies that administer naloxone or Narcan before our arrival. And so I'm glad you brought up all those other agencies. It, very much a team effort, right, for you to work closely with the volunteer fire and the, the, the law enforcement as well. Can you speak to that as well? Sure. Yeah. Because of the uptick and because they're – the ambulance is only as close as the ambulance is. And, uh, you know, while our response times are uh, six to seven minutes, there may be someone from the fire department or there may be someone from one of the law enforcement agency that, that's closer. So not knowing what time in which the overdose occurred, it is uh, it's a very time-sensitive issue. When someone stops breathing, uh, for every minute that passes, their chance of survival diminishes by 10%. So if it exceeds 10 minutes, just, uh, outcomes are poor. Mm -hmm. And how often typically is it, I guess it just depends, right, on where the person's at and who's closer, because again, who might get first to the scene, right, might be law enforcement. That's correct. So. Yeah, we've, we've, we've seen a significant uptick in the administration of Clarksville Fire and Rescue and mm -hmm. uh, Clarksville Police Department. And as far as, um, again, this is a team effort, and recently, uh, just recently, the mayor's office has said, hey, we're going to do consolidate the city um, opioid task force with the ASAP, with, so I have a joint effort. Can you speak to how that joint effort is helps you do what you need to do? Sure. If it, all of us in the room, then we can uh, learn from each other what we're encountering, it, and everyone stays situationally aware. So from the county mayor's office to the city mayor's office. Mayor Durrett or Mayor Pitts, uh, everyone stays well informed. It, it as well gives us an avenue to explore uh, other options and ideas that we may not have thought of to address the opioid crisis. And the, the crisis, it seems, as you've talked about going from, you know, one decade to the next, it seems like it just re really recently has kind of just really spiked up what in your research and just being your, your work in your experience have you noticed that might have kind of led to this um, kind of uptick that we've seen? Yeah, so we see uh, both prescription opioids being abused as well as illegally acquired opioids uh, such as heroin of the street uh, fentanyl. I would have to conclude based on our experiences that uh, these are people that had absolutely no intention of uh, becoming an addict. They had no intention of over, and I certainly don't think that anyone wakes up in the morning and goes, well, one, the very first thing I'd like to do today is get addicted to something or the, as well as waking up in the morning and say, I think I'll overdose today. Mm -hmm. I don't think either of those things are, uh, are prospects that people plan to do. But when you're exposed to something that pushes that feel-good button uh, in your brain, and, and we'll just, for uh, lack of a better term, say that it pushes a button that creates a circus in your brain, and suddenly you feel better than you've ever felt before. And certainly that could be the case if you have uh, chronic pain or, or chronic problems, and you attempt to match that same feel-good feeling every day. And because of the nature of the opioids, it requires more frequent dosing and higher dosing uh, up to that point that if you're not tolerant then you stop breathing and if you stop breathing long enough then you die. So it's typically people who just like you said never expected this to happen maybe innocently and I've got a prescription and then just kept going. 
Right. It would be so easy if we could teach all of the emergency services what an opioid addict looks like. But you can't yeah. because it has no socioeconomic boundary. It is, it is someone like me that may, may have gone somewhere uh, to seek uh, treatment for back pain. Next thing you know, they're prescribing an opioid. It ha and I happen to be one of those people that really enjoys the way that it makes me feel. It makes me feel better than I've ever felt before. Mm -hmm. And I get kind of attached to that. And I want to feel that good, well, every day or every minute and every moment. So, and it requires more and more opioids at, at higher and higher doses. And then there's also that incident where you have people throw alcohol into the mix too. Then that, how does that change the equation? Right. So we do, you know, the majority of uh, time we, uh, it's a, what we refer to as a poly overdose mm -hmm. or a poly substance abuse. Again, it, it is uh, the endorphin, the receptor sites that endorphins would normally use, like a runner's high, if you've ever heard about mm -hmm. that. Is, is what these opioids target, and it does make you feel better. And people, uh, to people for hundreds of years have used alcohol in which to treat their pain. So it definitely complicates things. It for does. Sure. So how do you in in working again in the sort of administration field in which you're in and policy? How have you sort of tailored your your policy and administration to kind of say, okay, everybody, we need to be looking out for these certain warning signs or how do you how do you kind of do with that I guess maybe watching to see whether that's an, an issue when you come upon a call obviously then other than the, the bottle being there right because you can't really say well this person looks like mm -hmm. a, a opioid addiction patient uh, you have to keep all your senses readily available to you and look for the signs at the scene we could very, uh, and we do encounter this quite frequently, where we don't get the call. The call doesn't come through 911, hey, they've overdosed on heroin, or hey, they've taken mm -hmm. too many of their, their pills. Call may come in that I can't wake them up, or mm -hmm. that they're having difficulty breathing, or they have an altered level of consciousness. And then we arrive on the scene and suddenly, well, we discover that, well, there's a needle hanging out of their arm, mm -hmm. or we see the evidence of the, of the pill bottles, or there's just more information. Or they could be have there are certain specific physiologic signs uh, that we look for. And how have you, obviously, as a medical professional, you've had to adjust your the training you get and your your paramedics get. How have you adjusted that over time as to to deal with this? Well, it's all situational awareness. Though every, every one of us were taught that uh, Narcan is given for opioid overdoses. Or it may be given if someone is unconscious, unresponsive, or in arrest, and we don't have uh, any known etiology. We don't know uh, why. Now it happens so frequently is that the the naloxone, which once remained in the truck waiting for us to, is now one of those first line agents. So it changes our approach entirely. Definitely. And as you look ahead to the future, Jimmy, what what are you trying to anticipate, you know, watching to see where that, that puck is going to see where that next issue is? What are, what are you, your statistics and research showing you? Right now it's all ticking up. Mm -hmm. the, the first 15 days of 2019 compared to the first 15 days of 2018. In 2018 we administered naloxone 32 times. First 15 days of 2019, 71 times. So greater than 120% uh, uptick in administrations of, uh, of Narcan. I, I really see our condition as uh, one of uh, very personal, very, we need a culture change. We have to change the way in which uh, medicine is practiced so that we, we don't identify those people who have a tendency to have that circus button pushed in their brain mm -hmm. um, that says, hey, I need more of this feeling. Jimmy Edwards, thank you for You're stopping welcome. by and speaking with us here at APSU TV and 91.9 FM. And our uh, interview continues with Chris Proctor up in just a few minutes. Thank, thank you. you.
Thanks for joining us here at APSU TV and 91.9 FM. I'm Micah Terrell. We're talking about the opioid epidemic and how serious of a problem this is. And at the outset, a few minutes ago, we mentioned how, according to the governor's office, about three Tennesseans die every day um, due to some opioid-related overdose. And it's a serious problem. And we are speaking with Montgomery County EMS officials today about how serious it is for them because obviously they're on ground zero for this epidemic. And joining me now is Chris Proctor, and he is the assistant chief of operations with Montgomery County EMS. Chris, thank you for stopping by. Thank you for having us. No problem. Now, we talked about how serious it was um, earlier and everything. I want you to kind of take us through the procedure that paramedics go through when they receive word of a possible opioid over overdose. Can you step us, take us step by step? Sure. Um, it's always nice to have that, that specific information when we get dispatched to the call so we can formulate a game plan and route and we can get the necessary uh, other resources en route to that call as well because it's always a team effort when it comes to those kind of patients. But we find ourselves uh, arriving on scenes where it necessarily doesn't, didn't come across as that was the call, but we have assessed the situation and realized that we now have an opioid overdose. And then we, we first of all, we'll make sure the scene is safe for all providers, you know, ensure that there's no um, needles or anybody there that could potentially cause harm to our staff and other responders. And then we, we allow our, our EMTs and paramedics to do, to do what they've been trained to do, is proper assessment, scene survey, um, question those that are on scene to ensure what, what they're responding to or what they've arrived to. And then, again, they follow protocol, procedures, they, they know which medications to administer, and then and transport to the hospital. Now, as far as you mentioned, some sometimes you might have a patient that might be, you know, have a needle and maybe maybe seriously almost unconscious, but you mm -hmm. might have a, a or not a victim, but a, a patient who might be violent. How sure. how do you adjust to, to deal with that? So if if we kind of know that going into it, we always try and allow law enforcement to make sure scene safe. Uh, if we arrive first and then we encounter a violent patient, we just try to step away, to back out, get away from the scene, notify law enforcement. We do run into that occasion quite often, and again, our paramedics and EMTs are trained to, to know what to do and back out of a, a hostile situation. And that's good. Now, as far as uh, protecting yourself from the actual fentanyl itself, obviously it's a very potent drug and it can cause uh, overdoses quite easily. What sort of um, protection um, efforts do you or your paramedics do? To yes, ma'am. So if, if we have the ability, we'll go ahead and we can don what we call protective uh, equipment, PPE, mm -hmm. personal protective equipment, and it will protect us, our skin, our clothes, from getting any kind of fentanyl dust on ourselves. We have masks, gowns, things like that. So. We try very carefully to, to prevent any instances like, from like that happening. However, sometimes you, you don't realize it and then you're in the middle of it. So we just try to remove ourselves from the situation, uh, get into a, uh, a clean environment, decon ourselves, and then so we can get back available. And as far as training goes, obviously there's some very specialized training. Can you talk about the, the training that uh, the paramedics go through to, to be able to address these, these kinds of calls? Sure. So we have a training uh, department within our facility. Our training officers stay on top of the latest and the greatest when it comes to, you know, uh, response and, and proper medication administration. Uh, we also work with our local uh, agencies, uh, our, our drug task force, to stay up on top of, you know, recent information, recent data on the, on the newest drugs that are out there on the street, j just so we can prepare better. Yeah, because I'm sure there are probably there are new ones coming out pretty, pretty regularly, right? right. Re yeah. So we have to stay in touch with our other mm -hmm. agencies to, to stay up on top of the, the most recent information. Yeah, so you probably talk to the police department, law enforcement pretty often. Well, What's the definitely. new thing that's on the street, right? Correct, most definitely. Now, what about counterfeit drugs versus um, maybe uh, drugs that are processed maybe at an actual you know, pharmacy or compounding uh, mm -hmm. facility? Do you run across a lot of illicit drugs that are just kind of homemade as well? We probably run across that more often than we do the prescription mm -hmm. meds. Um, we see that the they're 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 getting smart and mm -hmm. they're they're creating. New, new medicines constantly. So, yes, we are seeing that a lot, and that's part of the education that we have to stay on top of. Definitely. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Now, um, as far as um, more prescriptions than people, I noticed in 2015, it looks like we had like 118 prescriptions per 100 people. So people are getting these le mostly legitimately, right? And it mm -hmm. starts out pretty innocently and everything. Yes. Um, so I guess what, how are you, 
educating yourselves and, and learning how to do like, okay, obviously you can, you can find the bottle there. That's great. But, but what sort of training again, do you do to kind of keep yourselves aware of what's, what's what in, in, in the call? Yeah. So we, we step on top of, like I said, prescription medicines. We want to stay educated. We take routine ed uh, monthly trainings. We have online trainings, things like that, that we can stay updated on. And then we like to try and educate the, pu the, the, the public. You know, when we're on scenes, we try to make sure they stay within their allotted dosages, uh, make sure they know signs and symptoms of uh, an adverse reaction when it comes to taking their own medications. So not only we try to stay educated, we try to educate the public as well. Now, uh, say for instance, you go uh, to a scene and you encounter someone who may be overdosing. What if they refuse the Narcan and they say no? What What do you? What's your procedure to deal with them? So we've never really had the ability or the opportunity, I should say, to have somebody refuse the Narcan. We've always been able to administer that without any problems. What we are finding from time to time, though, is that if we administer it on scene and before we transport, now the patients become awake and alert and oriented to the point where they can try and refuse the transport to the hospital. So what we've tried to do as a department to combat that per se, because we believe all patients that have encountered this situation should be evaluated by an emergency room physician. So our paramedics are trained to give a um, certain amount of dosages of the Narcan in route to the hospital. So that way, by the time we get them to the hospital, they're now able to speak, make decisions, mm -hmm. things like that. And now they're already in the hospital being evaluated. So we don't try to wake them up fully on the scene because we really don't want them to refuse to be transported. Pretty, pretty scary stuff. What's that like? I mean, obviously you probably see that. What is it like to see that situation where you might have someone who's completely unconscious, maybe not breathing sure. on their own, and then administer? Typically, is it take one or two? And and how do you do that? Do you is it something they inhale or how do you? Right. So first responders give it via uh, via the nose, intranasally is what we call it. Um, if we, as paramedics, we can provide it via an IV. It allows us to give smaller doses, allows us to wake them up slower. It provides a better outcome of the patient versus some ad adverse reactions to a lot of Narcan quickly. Um, so what we see is, is yes, our patients aren't breathing, uh, very blue in color, and if first responders have gotten on scene first, potentially when we arrive there, now they're talking to us. So we encourage highly to be transported to the hospital. Definitely, because like you said, they need to be checked out by. Right, because Narcan only lasts for approximately 30 minutes. So we sure don't want to leave somebody at a residence or a location and 30 minutes later, they're back in the same situation they were previously. Right, definitely. Now, as far as um, what you deal with when you have someone you've, you've brought back and, and everything, how Give me your your first like I guess your first person experience when you've seen one person go through that that situation and then you can't get called back to that residence again mm -hmm. to see and bring them back once once again. What's it like to to deal with that situation? Because you probably encounter that quite a bit. We do, as a matter of fact. And the odd part about that is sometimes we encounter it multiple people on one location. It could be friends of each other, family members. In all honesty, it's it's almost sad to say, but it's it's almost frustrating on emergency responders' uh, side of the house because we know that we're there to, to to take care of those that are injured or harmed or, or or need our assistance. But we also know too that repeat offenders could take away our ability to help somebody else in a close proximity that needs us in a in a cardiac event or a stroke or a seizure. And if we're in a rural area tending to repeat offender, something could happen in that same rural area and it creates a long uh, response time for us. So it can become frustrating as a, as a responder. And how do you try to prepare for those situations? Because obviously in Montgomery County, we do. We have a lot of hills, a lot of rural areas. We're not all metropolitan just yet. Sure. But, but how, do you, how do you prepare for that? So we ask our, our paramedics, our, our units, and our supervisors to be aware of the, of the calls. Uh, move assets into other areas if those zones are uncovered to help uh, preempt any calls that we may have while we're already tending to another emergency situation. So it's a lot of, again, thinking ahead and, and probably, I guess, you, you learn from what, where you go. Do you have any particular areas of the county that tend to be hot spots for, for this kind of issue or is I, it I all think over? It's, I think it's pretty much all it's over. It's all over? Yes, ma'am. 
Glad you know. How um, how often have you found, because um, I know we, we addressed a little bit with uh, Jimmy a few minutes earlier, law enforcement helping, responding with you. Are you typically getting there right as, as they're helping out? Because I know they have to be able to be trained to, with the old Narcan too. Right? Correct. So what, that's what's probably one of the huge reasons that we have armed the law enforcement and fire side of the house with Narcan is because sometimes our response, whether it be our, well, we, our goal is five to seven minute response time, but if we're making calls and we're busy and we're delayed getting to those patients, we know that fire and law has the ability to, to initiate that care. So we, we lean on those guys and girls to be able to help us with those particular patients just in case we do have a, a lengthy response time. And so you've got not just yourselves who are really invested in these patients, but we've got law enforcement now too. Do you feel like this has created more of a teamwork kind of um, aspect for you? Sure, not only teamwork, it's created um, uh, work for us as well for responding to the patients and then attempting to educate law enforcement and uh, fire and the, and the volunteer fire department. So we're having to educate those staff members as well on the administration of the Narcan. So yes, it's, it's created a, a tremendous amount of work for our department. And as far as, because um, I don't think everybody necessarily realizes, it's not just med calls that you're seeing the situation, right? You might be traffic accident. Can it talk to us through about kind of just the variety of, of different times you've in situations you've seen this happen? Yeah, sure. So somebody driving by in a parking lot can see somebody slumped over a wheel, can see a vehicle on the shoulder of the road, and don't know what it is, but yet they call concern. So we can show up and find that this individual is potentially overdosed. We might not know that yet, um, but, but that's, we're finding that more and more often that, that these people are seeing these people out in the, in the general public acting um, strangely and calling 911 and, and we're finding that that's what's happened when we arrive on scene is they've overdosed on some form of medication. And finally, um, Chris, can you kind of give us an idea of, of what the community can do? Because we know we've already got a lot of people invested. We got you and EMS. Uh, the paramedics are very invested. We got law enforcement. What can regular folks do to help deal with this um, issue of opioid overdoses? Right. I think stay vigilant, uh, educate themselves, read as much as they can. Uh, I think it's important to uh, stay upon your medications, uh, make sure your medication regimen is appropriate and doctor ordered. If you're concerned about your medication list, reach out to your physician, uh, ask them questions. I, I think it's important to, to be your own advocate, to make sure you're taking care of yourself. So just, just stay aware. That's what, I would, that's what I'd recommend. Great, education is key, right? That's right, <laughs> education is key, yep. Chris, thank you. Uh, any other thoughts about uh, where we're headed with, with this issue of, of the opioid um, issue, where obviously it seems like it's just steadily growing and growing? Mm -hmm. No, I, I think it's just we we as first responders need to be keenly aware of what's going on in our in our community. Uh, stay educated, 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 and stay aware of what's going on and be prepared to respond. Definitely. Chris, thank you so much. Thank Chris you for Proctor us. with Montgomery County EMS and I'm Micah Terrell with APSU TV and WAPX FM ninety one nine.